for joining us tonight. We're presenting on butterfly and hummingbird gardening. Our guest speaker is Richard Paul. Richard is a certified master gardener. Um, he has spent a lot of time uh, he, uh, researching butterfly and hummingbird gardening and has put together an incredible uh, presentation for you this evening. So Richard, welcome and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Joanne. So as Joanne said, my name is Richard Paul um, and this is a butterfly and hummingbird gardening pr presentation. Uh, as a reminder, we're Brazoria County, Texas and our USDA hardiness, hardiness zones are 9A and 9B. Uh, most of the plants, I think, are going to fall within that, uh, but there could be some exceptions inside here. So I compiled this information starting uh, before, uh, early early this year for uh, the new intern training in 2023. I was an intern last year, and, and so let, uh, I've only been a master gardener for about a year, and I enjoyed the program quite a bit, and I decided, well, I'll try doing one of these lectures. So in this presentation, what uh, we're going to go over a little bit is the uh, uh, a little information on the uh, gardening types, um, uh, some information on what type of hummingbirds we might see over here, what type of butterflies, and then I, I have several different plants and, and uh, uh, flowers and that, I, that are selected or said to be really popular for butterflies and hummingbirds. And then also I have several lists. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Okay, so the hummingbird garden. Uh, this garden, it can be as simple as container gardens. Uh, it can on a balcony, it could be patio gardens, or it could be an elaborate garden throughout the whole yard, incorporating native trees, the shrubs, vines, and flowers. For uh, planting, you would like to, you should plan a floral variety with rich nectar sources, overlapping bloom times, running water, and adequate cover. For design, you would like to incorporate from small plants to taller plants so that you have, you know, a, a kind of a growth, putting your big plants in the back. You have your vines and then shrubs and trees and keep that um, um, layered for visibility. Hummingbirds, major sources of food are flower nectar and tiny insects and spiders that are attracted to flowers. I was kind of surprised about the tiny insects and spiders. I don't know why, I always just thought they, they liked nectar. Um, selecting appropriate nectar flowering plants that bloom during fall and winter will provide for the highest concentration of hummingbirds and the largest number of species. Spring can also be a good time because of the migrations that we have. So um, consider providing nesting material for hummingbirds, such as very fine cotton fibers in a suet cage or some cotton balls or that, um, that, uh, that you can find that have some nesting material. And you can just hang it underneath a tree or you can plant appropriate plants that will have the natural fibers. Provide a safe habitat by discouraging feral and domestic cats from stalking and preying upon hummers and keeping ants, bees, and wasps off of hummingbird feeders. The hummingbird feeders. So um, selecting a hummingbird feeder, it's good to have one with perches, perches um, it, red, it being red colored to attract the hummingbirds, has some kind of protection from ants, bees, and wasps. Um, and then consider choosing a feeder that is easy to clean and or dishwasher safe. Smaller volume feeders will encourage more frequent changing and cleaning. So one of the issues I have in the summer, if I do a, a regular size hummingbird feeder, if I fill it up, it's, it's more uh, nectar than what the hummingbirds are gonna go through. And I end up having to throw it out. So you either have to uh, put less inside the, in the jar or, or use the smaller feeders. And I prefer the, myself, I prefer the smaller feeders. On the quantity, you could consider spare feeders, which will allow rotation of feeders and provide time for cleaning and drying without disrupting the feeding. 
So if you have a couple of extra, you can take them down and then and then uh, fill uh, ones that you've already cleaned and just put those right up. Um, you want to clean the feeders with hot water or a weak vinegar solution every four to five days and more frequently if temperatures are over 90 degrees Fahrenheit to prevent harmful mold and bacteria growth. Uh, you want to place the feeders under shade and close to shelter or places for the hummingbirds to perch while in clear view for your observation. It's a good idea to place the feeder near colorful flowers that are attracting hummingbirds already. Locate multiple small feeders out of line of sight from each other to attract more hummingbirds to your yard and reduce territorial hummingbirds from monopolizing multiple feeders. I've had, you know, where I've had feeders on two different trees that are fairly close together, I can always see the, I can see a lot of hummingbirds uh, chasing each other. And I don't know why it's that way here. If you go over to some other places, I've seen like 15 or 20 hummingbirds around a feeder, but I haven't been able to get that many to be close together in this area. So, so the, the, uh, for a hummingbird nectar, you want to mix one part white granulated cane sugar with four parts water and boil for one to two minutes to delay fermentation and allow it to cool before putting it out. Do not add red food coloring and any extra nectar can be stored in a refrigerator for seven to 10 days before use. So again, with the heat that we have, you wanna be changing out your nectar fairly often. And then these pictures are a few examples. This is a, you can fill this up with water uh, as an ant moat. This one has an ant moat built in and it has like the bee and wasp guards. There's a moat that goes around here. And this one, it's a small feeder, it's not very big. I had some of these also. Uh, it's really easy to clean, but it, it, this particular one doesn't have any guards on it. So you, you can add, you know, like a little uh, um, upside down umbrella or something like that, fill that up with water and then you'll have an ant, or the ants can't get to it. Okay, so ruby-throated, a uh, ruby-throated hummingbird. Um, it's the most commonly seen hummingbird in Texas. 40% of all hummingbird sightings in Texas will be a ruby-throated hummingbird. It's common to abundant bi-seasonal transient migrant early March to late October. It may overwinter in Texas, but are noticeably absent in June and July as they migrate further north during these two months, placing them in the seasonal and not annual category. Prefer open woodlands and are often seen in parks, gardens, and backyards. They're solitary birds, except during mating periods when they are fiercely territorial and aggressive towards hummingbirds of other species. It's relatively small, 2.8 to 3.5 inches long. Um, I have found uh, hummingbird nests in uh, ball brushes that I had in our first house. So I had two really nice large ball brushes until the freezes got them. Uh, but Anyway, I was really surprised to find a nest in there. Uh, black chin hummingbird. So this is the this is the second most commonly seen hummingbird in Texas at 33% of all hummingbird sightings in Texas. It's an uncommon winter terminal migrant, early September to early April. A migrating species in the western US that began migrating south for the winter towards Mexico from the middle of July to the middle of October. It's a its size is three and a quarter inches to three and three quarter inches long. And so, so as you see on the pictures, you can see the differences between the female and the male. That's, and then this is the bottom one has is a, a female or an immature male. The buff-bellied hummingbird. It's the third most commonly seen hummingbird in Texas at 13% of all hummingbird sightings in Texas. It's an uncommon and irregular winter visitor, very rare summer straggler, late September through early May. Regularly disperses northeast into Louisiana from its breeding areas in southernmost Texas after the breeding season to spend the winter. It's a fairly large size, 3.9 inches to 4.3 inches long. 
So a few other hummingbirds that can be found in humming in, <laughs> in Brazoria County. You have the rufous, the broad tail, and the calliope. So the rufous is an uncommon to common fall transient migrant and winter terminal migrant. It's uh, in late July through early April. The broad-tailed is an uncommon winter terminal migrant early October through early April. And the calliope is a rare winter terminal migrant in bi-seasonal transient early October through early March. So these are the most common ones that you would see in Brazoria County. Not saying that these are common. I, uh, they, they can be hard to find. So there are 16 species of hummingbirds have been reported in Texas, more than any other state. At least 12 species have been identified in Brazoria County. So I have a couple of, a few range maps that I'll put in here just for reference. Um, and down here, I'll just point this out. I have a link to where I found these range maps. It's hummingbirds in Texas. And then this icon is on some of the slides. This represents the hummingbirds. So this slide is in particular for hummingbirds. Um, I just want to point that out. Um, so as we go through this, so this is uh, just a, the most common ones that we would see, the ruby-throated. So this is their breeding range, this darker red color right in here. That's the breeding range. This is a less common breeding range outside here. And then this is the non-breeding range over here. And then a, a less common breeding range. And then so you, um, we're right in this area. So they, we should be able to see some breeding uh, ruby-throated um, hummingbirds in our area. On the black chin, so you have the breeding outside or breeding area over here. We're just outside of that. But you see this the light blue part that is a non-breeding. It's less common, uh, but we, you could see them as they migrate. And then over here, they have a non-breeding, which is a common area in Louisiana for the on the black chin. Um, and then in this this other color, this darker, I don't know, magenta or purple almost. This is a year-round area. So this is where you could find them in year-round you know, the south of us. But anyway, just wanted to point that out. So when we get to the buff bellied, when we get along the coast, and we're not too far away from that. Again, we're over in this area. Um, you can find, find them year round more along the coast, a little bit further south from us. So, uh, but they do pass over in the wintertime, coming, going to Louisiana, and, and then they, you could find them. Um, in the winter in the non-breeding area from this area. So they have, you can find these maps for others, for the other, other um, um, species. Well, here's a few more, sorry, I forgot. I have the rufous. So we're down here, it's in the light blue. So this is gonna be in the winter time. Um, the broad tail, it's only 2% year round in Texas. So in our area, it would be even less, and the Calliope is at 0.6%. You see that very, there's a very light blue that's running over here, we're right in there. So, you know, there's a potential for seeing them, maybe uh, uh, down near Freeport in that area, you might be able to see more of them. Okay. Just as a uh, reminder, you probably heard about Texas Superstar plants, but I just wanted to put this in as a reminder. Uh, Texas Superstar plants are plants that are highly recommended by Texas A&M AgriLife, and they're a good source to assist when selecting plants. Additional plants, uh, uh, besides the ones that I'm showing in, in, on the slide uh, or um, from the brochure that are recommended for pollinators are Mex Mexican bush sage, uh, Henry Dualberg salvia, the uh, Blue Princess verbena, Victoria perennial phlox, and John Fannick perennial phlox. But all these that are on these pictures are, are ones that I have in my yard. I have the firebush. I, I like this plant a lot. I have several of these. I have two fairly large Texas lilacs. Um, and then I have the Mystic Spires blue salvia. That's some of the salvias that I have. 
All these are Texas superstar plants and they're rec recommended for uh, throughout Texas. Okay. Um, this is a, this is, describes how to find information on Brazoria County's 87 butterflies. So this slide has a butterfly on it. So the ones that have just a butterfly will be pertaining to butterflies. If I have a butterfly and a hummingbird in the corner, it'll be for both. It'll represent both of them. But if we go over to, to this link, let me see if I can do this here. Just want to show you this real quick. Because I, I found it pretty interesting. Just bear with me as I as I share it. So if you want to find out what type of butterflies, if you want to learn more about the butterflies in our area, you can go to the species profiles. Go to regional checklists, and then you can select a species type. We're going to select butterfly. We're going to pick United States. You can go to Texas. And then we're going to choose Brazoria County. And this is where I got the number of butterflies from that we that you could find in here was is based off of this. And we hit apply. And then it'll in in a, a few seconds it'll print out a spreadsheet of the various types of butterflies. Should there it is. Okay. All right. So this is the butterflies. So I have a complete checklist. I ended up putting this in a spreadsheet for you know I was going to play around with it a little bit. Um, but it's broken down into the different the different families. So you got the skippers, the uh, pronations and swallowtails. We'll get into more detail. But the main thing I wanted to show about this 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 spreadsheet is is that you can come in here and you could pick out a um, uh, pick out one of these like the eastern tiger swallowtail, and you can go through and one it has lots of pictures. In there, so you can see the what the what they what it looks like, and what the um, caterpillars look like, in the different stages. So it's a really good, it's a nice, a real nice source. The other nice thing about it is it gives you a description of the uh, butterflies, and it tells you what the caterpillar hosts, what their host foods are, and then what the adult foods are. So. Um, it's just a little bit more information if you want to, you know, if you want to learn more about the uh, different types of butterflies in the area. Okay. I'm going to go back to my. Go back to my slide here. Okay. So this is the uh, the skipper family of butterflies. So skippers do not belong to the super family Papilloni papillonado, the true butterflies. There are 37 species of around 3,500 worldwide can be found in Brazoria County. Most skippers are small to medium, usually orange, brown, black, white, or gray. A few have iridescent colors. The skippers have large eyes, short antenna, often with hooked clubs, stout bodies, and three pairs of walking legs. Their flight is often rapid, making wing movement appear blurred. Adults of most species have a long proboscis and feed on floral nectar, but some also take up nutrients from bird droppings. Uh, males of most species locate mates by perching perching uh, grass and giant skippers, though some patrol, especially in the open wing skippers. And globular eggs are laid singly. So this is a silver spotted skipper as an example of one of them. Then you have the carnations and swallowtails. These are the ones that I really, it's my, my favorite ones. Uh, they are considered a true butterfly. 
There are seven species of around 560, world, six, 560 worldwide can be found in Brazoria County. They have brilliant colors. The many swallowtail species mimic other butterflies that are distasteful while others are distasteful and cause birds and other vertebrate predators to regurgitate. Swallowtail adults are medium to large and may or may not have tails, while Parnassian adults are medium, tailless, and have translucent wings. All adult Parnassians and swallowtails have three pairs of walking legs, and adults of all species visit flowers for nectar. So this one's a giant swallowtail. The whites and sulfurs. Whites and sulfurs are members of the true butterflies. There are 11 species of around 1,100 worldwide can be found in Brazoria County. Adults have medium to small wings that are white, yellow, orange, with some black or red, and many have hidden ultraviolet patterns that are used in courtship. Adults of all species visit flowers for nectar, and adults of both sexes have three pairs of walking legs. The majority of caterpillars of North America, whites and sulfurs feed on legumes or crucifers, members of the mustard family. And typically temperate species overwinter in the pupil or larval stage, while tropical species overwinter as adults. The gossamer wing butterflies, we have a few of these. They're considered a true butterfly. There are 13 species found in Brazoria County of the 400 or 4,700 worldwide. The adults are typically small to tiny and often brilliantly colored, iridescent blues, bright reds, and oranges. Adults of both sexes have three pairs of walking legs, so most males have few segments in their front legs. Most adults visit flowers for nectar, but some harvesters, harvesters feed on woolly aphid honeydew and some hair streaks feed on aphid honeydew or bird droppings. And females lay single sea urchin shaped eggs on host leaves or flower buds. The resulting caterpillars are typically slug shaped. The four footed or brush footed butterflies they're part, they're, they're part of the true butterflies. They are, there are 19 species of, of this uh, family are found in Brazoria County out of the 6,000 worldwide, only 19. Adults vary in size from small to large and their front legs are reduced, unable to be used for walking. Wing shape is also highly variable. Some species have irregular margins, angle wings and commas and others have long tail-like projections, dagger wings. Browns, oranges, yellows, and blacks are frequent colors, while iridescent colors such as purples and blues are rare. Adults of some groups are the longest lived butterflies surviving six to 11 months. Brushfoots overwinter as larvae, larvae or adults. So you have the monarch and the gulf fritter, fritter, or are just a couple of these that are uh, in this area. Okay, so host and nectar plants. When it comes to planting for butter, uh, uh, planting for butterflies, it is important to keep in mind the differences between butterfly host plants and nectar plants. Host plants are plants on which adult butterflies lay their eggs and caterpillars feed. Nectar plants provide food for adult butterflies. So adult butterflies may visit many different nectar flowers in search of food but their caterpillars are exceedingly particular when it comes to their host plants. Now, and keep in mind, when you're planting host plants, the, the caterpillar is gonna be eating those host plants. So you may wanna try to put these more towards the back of an area instead of in the front, because they're gonna, you know, they're gonna get chewed on and eaten. Um, and here you can see pictures of the monarch eggs and caterpillars at di different, uh, uh, larval stages. So you have uh, the uh, uh, the first instar. So this would be like the first molt. There's some really small ones, but then they molt and they'll get a little larger. By the time you get to the fourth instar, they look quite a bit different than here, and they've grown grown a lot. And then you have like the chrysalis that you might see, 
and then an adult monarch. So <clears throat> flowering perennials offer nectar for bees, moss, hummingbirds, and butterflies alike. Some flowers are better suited for butterflies than others in terms of size, shape, nectar, productivity, and when they bloom. So you have the size and shape of the flowers is important. Butterflies need a perch to sit on while they sit. So prefer using flowers with a broad platform like purple cone flowers, Gallardia, wine cup, and iris. Butterflies can also cling to clusters of very small flowers like those found on the goldenrod and lantana. If you want to stage, you want to choose your flowers for um, thinking about when they when it blooms. So butterflies will be trickling in through spring to late summer. So remember to plant nectar flowers that will bloom at different times so you always have something for them to eat. Planting some uh, fall bloomers like Beatrice, cardinal flower and obedient plants is, is a, a, will ensure that you have uh, some flowers for butterflies arriving later in the summer and into early fall. And then you also wanna plant native. When it comes to planting nectar plants, try and stick to native varieties. Butterflies have selected plants for good nectar production, but be aware that human plant breeders select for color or long bloom season and they may inadvertently select out those important butterfly requirements. So they may not produce as much nectar as the na native plants. So, so this is a, a list of a few nectar plants for butterflies. Uh, this, this came from the Houston Arboretum and Nature Center. So I have a link right there. Uh, um, Examples of this would be like the American Beautyberry, Aster, Blue Mist Flower. And then uh, on the right hand side, I have the flowering season. So you can go, you can run through this list at, 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 on, at your own time. And then you can go through here and then uh, pick out, you know, potentially pick out some flowers and then make sure that you're staggering out your flowers so that you have all the different seasonings, or not seasonings all the different seasons covered. So uh, now me, I, I, I'm a kind of a lazy gardener. I, I like to have something that's gonna start in the spring and then and stay throughout the fall. So I, I have a lot of salvias growing and that seems to work fairly well. Uh, but if you wanna mix it up and add some more things, uh, here's some, there's some, a lot of selections inside here to add to it, you know. Right now, all my purple cone flowers, they're gone. So they, they just, they didn't, they don't, they don't last the whole time for me. Um, choosing host plants for butterflies. So host plants are the specific plants that, that as we discussed, various speci species of butterflies lay their eggs on and their caterpillars will eat. So this is an example of a butterfly let, uh, laying its egg on the underside of the leaves. It curls its abdomen around it. Um, I have a, what is it, passion fruit vine. I have a lot of passion fruit vine that's growing in my backyard. And so I see gold curlieries all the time going over there and they curve their abdomen around. So I, I could tell, well, they must be laying their eggs. Um, now I haven't noticed all my leaves disappearing though. So I'm kind of curious about what's happening. It might just be that my, maybe my vines are just so big that it's handling how many caterpillars I have. I don't know. But you wanna make sure that you plant a lot of food because the caterpillars increase in size up to a thousand times for, from the egg to the final molt. If there isn't enough of the host plants, they will starve. Better to plant lots of one food source than just a few plants of many species. So, um, and then a few host plants for butterflies. So, the, uh, uh, in the pictures, this is a, a, a black swallowtail that's laying eggs on some dill, I believe. Uh, and then you can see a, a, a young egg is going to be yellow. And then a, a little older egg is going to be this darker gray. Now this might be three days old or so. And then this is what the the uh, the caterpillar looks like at the first instar level, spiny and mostly black with a little whitish saddle. And then by the time you get to the fourth and fifth instars, 
They're green with black stripes and yellow dots. So th these get pretty big. And I don't know if, if, if how many people have planted dill, but I, I, dill just kind of reseeds itself. And, and uh, so I, I get a lot of these caterpillars in my dill, which I didn't recognize it when I first saw them. And uh, I was saying, wait a second, what's all these caterpillars doing on my, <laughs> on my dill? So, it, you know, it's, it's good to make sure um, you realize what those are, you know, because unlike a tomato hornworm, I want these, you know, but you know, tomato hornworm, I'm not a big fan of on my tomato plants. So they have, they have to go, but uh, these can have my deal. I'm fine with that. And so this list from the Houston Arboretum Nature Center, it goes through here. It, it has uh, uh, some of the various types of butterflies. And then it, it shows what type of uh, plants that you can plant. Or, you know, if you have a hackberry tree, then you might be able to figure out, okay, well, maybe if you see some butterflies around there, this might help you whittle down what type of butterflies they are. So you can do a couple different things with the, with the list. Um, additional things for uh, tips for butterfly gardening, you can furnish some basking stones or boards for butterflies to perch on when, when uh, sunning. Uh, provide caterpillar food sources in both sunny and shaded areas. Allow small unused areas to grow up with weeds uh, necessary for healthy butterfly caterpillars. So, you know, maybe there's some of the grasses and stuff. Uh, provide some damp areas. Butterflies cannot drink from open water sources, so they require moist sand, earth, or mud to get their water. Uh, a pan nearby with mashed fruits such as bananas and pears will attract butterflies, as you can see in this picture. And in this puddling area, they actually put some, there was some salt. Um, now that's a lot of butterflies. I don't, I don't know if this was where this was, where the, this was taken at. I have butterflies, but I don't have this many butterflies congregating in one spot. But anyway, it's a beautiful picture. Um, you want to avoid pesticide use in areas. So there's classes of insecticides that 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 can um, have long-term or long-lived and systemic um, poisons to being absorbed into the plant tissue where they linger as a chemical defense to pests. So you want to avoid uh, spraying or be cautious of what you're putting in your gardens. You know, it's best to just avoid spraying um, in your flower in the flower beds for butterflies. And it may take some time for the butterflies to discover your sanctuary. Um, you know, they're under a lot of pressure from the loss of habitat with the urban development. And, and uh, so with, with the new housing going in, shopping and recreational areas. So it's, it's really good to have provide for the butter, butterflies. So this is a, um, uh, there's a, uh, the next 10 plants are some plants that I, uh, that I found in an article it was listed as 10 excellent butterfly plants or that hummingbirds can't resist. So this is for both. So the butterfly bush, um, I have one of these. It's a, uh, I've tried to grow them before and I don't know if I had it in the wrong spot. It didn't do too well, but the one that I have now is doing pretty good. Um, it's a fast growing shrub, blooms all summer and fall, and are one of the easiest ways to attract lots of butterflies and hummingbirds. But you want to be careful that they can be invasive. So you want to look out for particular versions of, of a butterfly bush to get. So whether it's a sterile varieties or sold as seedless butterfly bush, um, you know, they, the height ranges from three to 10 feet, the light's full sun, zones five to 10. And it attracts butterflies, hummingbirds, and other pollinators. Blooms, it's one of the things that I like, blooms spring to early fall, you know, because I guess I'm a lazy gardener or something. <laughs> uh, hollyhocks. So I, I love hollyhocks. I, 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 have to, I haven't grown these yet, but I, I like the idea of hollyhocks. Um, so this says towers of flowers come in many colors and have been a favorite of cottage gardeners for years. They are a host plant to painted ladies and several other butterflies and skippers. 
Their single bloom varieties also attract hummingbirds. So they add dramatic height and interest to the back of the garden. So this is one way of getting some color over the back and attractive. So um, their size three to eight feet, full sun, zones three to eight. It's a short-lived perennial that often recedes. Uh, butterflies, hummingbirds, and other pollinators, and, and it uh, blooms summer to early fall. The Mexican sunflower, it attracts lots of larger butterfly species and hummingbirds. Uh, so you might want to look for one that's uh, uh, the torch varieties work best and are available in, oops, torch varieties work best and are available in yellow, orange, and red. Very easy to grow from seed. I think I have a hummingbird vine, I mean, a Mexican sunflower vine growing on my fence. So I get a lot of these little, little flowers on them. It, the, this height, the height is four to six feet, full to part sun and hardy in zones 10 to 11. Uh, it attracts butterflies, hummingbirds, pollinators, finches, and many seed eating birds. So it blends from summer to early fall. Milkweed. Milkweed is a very good, milk, milkweed is a must have butterfly plant. It, uh, not only is a, the host plant for monarchs, hummingbirds, and many other butterflies like these flowers too. Uh, there are many species and varieties available, so not so you have you can look around. There's swamp milkweed, different. I mean, there's several different varieties. Just be sure to get several of these plants because you know if you have one, they might the caterpillars might start on it, eat it all, and and not have enough food. So um, one of our other master gardeners was telling me that his plants they they just kind of decimate. So you want to make sure. You have several of these. The bee balm, bergamot, and the horse mint. So I love these little flowers on this. This is a native perennial plant adored by butterflies, hummingbirds, many pollinators, available in many colors and quick to naturalize and spread. It's a real showstopper in a butterfly garden. Um, it's full sun to part shade, zones four to nine. And it um, it blends spring to fall. So this, so, but I think this is a relatively small plant. And I think I'm missing the height on it. So the Egyptian star cluster uh, or pentas, it, it attracts butterflies and hummingbirds. Uh, pentas are available in a wide range of colors, but many report that red flowers seem to attract the most pollinators. It's beautiful and easy to care for annual, annual works wonderfully in containers and the garden. So the height is 12 inches to three feet, light full to part sun. It's, a, a, it's hardy in zones 10 to 11, so we just missed that. And it attracts butterflies, hummingbirds, and pollinators, and it blooms from late spring to fall. Salvia, this is the ones that I enjoy. I have several different types of salvia growing in my yard. So it's a versatile butterfly plant that is extremely popular with hummingbirds as well. Uh, lots of colors, sizes, and varieties already available. So um, I have some that get up to like four, four to five feet high. That, and then I have some that are only about eight inches, 12 inches high. So there's a quite a, quite a variety on these. Um, most of them require full sun, but you can find some for partial shade. Uh, they're zone, it's zoned for four to nine summer annuals. Uh, and then it attracts the hummingbirds, butterflies, pollinators, gold finches, sparrows, and other seed eating birds. And it blooms from late spring to early winter. So salvias are one of my favorites, the, the various varieties. The seven sunflower, this shrub is an exceptional butterfly plant that hummingbirds adore as well. Uh, it, the seven sunflower grows quickly and can be trimmed as a single or multi-stem tree. After flowers drop, long-lasting sepals turn an attractive rosy pink color, which makes the plant look like it's flowering for a second time. The height is 15 to 20 feet. It's a full sun, zones five to nine. It attracts butterflies, hummingbirds, and pollinators, and it blooms in the late summer to early fall. Verbena, also known as verbane, there's numerous varieties, but purple top verbane is highly recommended for bringing in the hummingbirds as well as butterflies, but reseeds easily. 
Um, you need to be careful about purple top vervain though. It's not generally recommended for southern states or semi-tropical climates as it can aggressively reseed in areas with mild winters. So it doesn't seem like we've had the, the, uh, a problem with mild winters here lately. <laughs> While it can get quite tall, it has a wonderful show through quality and doesn't block other flowers from sight. So height is six inches all the way up to six feet. It lights full sun. Some varieties are hardy in zones seven to 10. Um, attracts butterflies, hummingbirds, and other pollinators, and it, and it blooms from spring to early fall. Zinnias, so um, over at the uh, community, at the Pearland Community Gardens by the YMCA, where there's lots of zinnias that are self-seed inside the various vegetable gardens. So uh, you can see these out there. There's quite, it seems to be quite a popular flower that's growing. And uh, it's a fast growing annual that is exceptional at attracting butterflies. It is incredibly easy to grow from seeds. Uh, top recommended varieties for attracting hummingbirds and butterflies are Lilliput, State Fair, Cut and Come Again, Venery Giants, and the California Giants. So it's a, as I said, it's an annual, and it's uh, besides butterflies and hummingbirds, lots of birds in, uh, like them. So, so on this slide, I, I put this slide together because it, it what's in a name and a, a couple of additional recommended plants. So these two plants are plants that I have in my garden. And, and when I looked, I was looking at the names, um, they're both, they're both the com they have the same common name. So this cupia on the left is, is called a firecracker plant. And then the, this, the one on the right is called a firecracker plant. Now I'm used to calling the one on the right the firecracker plant. The one on the left I call a cigar plant, so or or cupia. But anyway, it, I thought it was kind of interesting that both of these plants are different plants, but they have the same name. Now, I, I, the hummingbirds love both of these. I've seen them in both of both of these. So anyway, it's good to know. Make sure you uh, <laughs> what what plant it is that that's being discussed. So a, a few additional um, plants, you have ornamental onions. It's, you know, it, uh, deer and rabbits don't like that, but butterflies, bees and hummingbirds love the onions. Uh, that's really, they're really good plants to have. I'm gonna go through, just run through these a little bit. Uh, Blazing star, also known as gay feather. They're really upright type of plants. Um, the hummingbirds like these too. Uh, the flower stalks remain attractive in winter and provide food for birds. So the height is from one to eight feet tall, and it but it blooms from late summer to fall. The blue false indigo, also known as wild indigo, that's another popular plant for hummingbirds and butterflies. It's easy to grow native plant. It's one of the first butterfly plants to bloom. So, um, and then this goes through and lists a few of the butterflies that it's a host plant for the orange sulfur, eastern tail blue, a hardy edge, and bald indigo dus dusky wing butterflies. So it's a nice host plant. Uh, garden flocks. So some garden floxes now. Uh, native garden flocks is a classic and tracks a wide variety of butterflies. Victoria is a Texas superstar plant. That's one of them. There's also another phlox. It's a John Fannett. That's a Texas superstar plant. So I got both of those labeled in here. They grow from two to four feet and they're a uh, full to part sun and it's zoned for four to eight. Lantana, so various varieties of lantana. Um, this is the uh, uh, new gold lantana that's shown in the picture right here. The, uh, and that's the one that is a Texas superstar. So this is a, a, another, another one. One thing to note about this, lantanas are toxic though. So, uh, but I do have lantanas, even though I have a, a, a little dog. The snapdragons, you have the host plant for common buckeye butterflies. Um, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're late spring to early fall is when they bloom. 
six to 30 inches tall. I think they're a beautiful, a beautiful tall plant. They're on, um, uh, you know, on, on the single stem like this. Yarrow is another one, yeah, available in a wide range of colors. Um, it's also one of those perennials that tends to grow and spread. So be sure to give it a little extra room. The height is two to four feet, light, full sun, zones three to nine. Attracts butterflies, hummingbirds, and other pollinators and blooms spring to summer. The common chives and garlic chives, that's part of the uh, onion family, the allium family, so our species. So uh, uh, the common chives are, are lovely purple and good nectar source in the spring and early summer. And garlic chives have pretty white blooms in late summer when butterfly numbers are at their peak. So the uh, common is 10 to 14 inches tall. Garlic is 18 to 24 inches. The light is full sun to park shade, zones three to nine, and blooms summer to fall. Um, aster, uh, New England asters, there's many varieties to choose from, but uh, New England asters are rec most recommended for attracting butterflies. They have the little yellow center here that, that, that really seems to attract them. Uh, excellent nectar plant, as well as important host for the pearl, pearl crescent butterfly. The size uh, is, says one to eight feet, depending on variety. The light is full sun, zones three to nine. And attracts quite a, uh, quite a few things. The blue mist spiria, or bluebeard, it's a deep purplish blue flowers. This shrub is a valuable nectar source for butterflies and other pollinators. It produces masses of flowers at the end of the season when little else is in bloom. So this is just at the end of the season. Uh, this says late spring to fall though. So I don't know, just the right size to tuck into the corner of the garden or stand alone. The height's two feet, full sun to part shade. And then cone flowers. So I had cone flowers. Uh, 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 I was doing the purple cone flowers, purpurea. And trying to, sorry. Sorry, uh, I got a problem with this part. How do you stuff it? Yeah, Ross. That's a, one of the problems with the dachshund. Sorry about that. I, I probably should have muted. Um, it's a, uh, um, a widely available award-winning cultivars, Ruby Star, Magnus, and White Swan work well also. Both natives and these cultivars come back year after year. So I, I, I love the purple cone flowers. I, like I said, I have some in my, in my yard. That and Black Eyed Susans. Uh, the Cosmos Carefree Annual may only last the summer, but attracting butterflies is easy with this pretty nectar plant. A wide variety of colors and sizes are available, so Cosmoses are a popular choice for college and butterfly gardens. Easy to start from seed, so it's, but it is an annual. Goldenrod, important nectar source for monarchs. This pretty perennial has proven it attracts 115 species of butterflies and moths. Although often blamed for seasonal allergies, its pollen is too heavy to be carried by wind and it's only spread by pollinators. Also provides seeds for songbirds. The height is one to six feet. The light's full sun to shade, zones five to nine, and attracts butterflies, pollinators, cardinals, lots of, lots of different birds. And it blooms from late spring to early winter. And Joe Pieweed, it, that's a native plant that really attracts pollinators. This is a really good one for this. Impressive on its own or planted in a group. It's one to try if you have plenty of space. It's a showstopper that will add height and interest to the back of your garden. The height is five to seven feet tall. It likes full to part sun. And marigolds, bright blooms, great for attracting butterflies all season long, either in containers or the garden. Uh, so this is another good plant to have, but you don't, you want to avoid the palm varieties where the center of the flowers and nectar aren't accessible. A pin cushion flower, great for the front of the garden and incredible at attracting butterflies. Nonstop blooms from late spring to early fall, really bring in the pollinators. 
super easy to grow, but doesn't always come back the next year if planted in heavy clay soil. So it might be considered an a, a, uh, annual, depending on how you have your garden. The dill, we discussed dill, but there's parsley, fennel, and rue. So um, golden alexanders are the native host plant for black swallowtails, but they're a little difficult to find in the stores. So these, these herbs you can plant, that which will attract the uh, black swallowtail. Um, now I had, have had rue before when we first bought this house and I put my gardens along the fence in the backyard. Uh, the, the person warned me about it, and, and if you're working out in the sun, he said to wear gloves because if your skin can get sensitive and it turn my, it can turn your skin brown, or uh, you might even get alert, be allergic to it after handling it. Uh, the other thing I found out is that I decided I didn't want it anymore at one point, and so I was trying to take it out, and I still have it coming up in my gardens. It just, it just stays there. So this is a T's Nursery Hummingbird Attractants list. So for those from the Houston area, I've been here around a long time. Uh, T's is a, a nursery that was in Bel Air. My wife was in medical school. We used to go there on uh, Sunday afternoons on a nice day after church. And, and we enjoyed walking around, looking at the plants and things. But this, this is the Hummingbird Attractant list. You can take a look at it and, and when you have the presentation. Uh, the yellow indicates ones that are good for butterflies also. So you'll see these on, on the butter on the butterfly list also, uh, the dahlias and things. But there's a list of flowers. And then the, the next sheet has shrubs, trees, and vines. So this is a, a, just a good list. On this particular one, if, the if I noted, found it as a Texas superstar, I would try to go in and put a Texas superstar mark by it. And then also if it was considered a Texas, Texas native, I was starting to go through here and, and list which ones were Texas natives like this red yucca, but I'm not complete on, on doing that. Um, the, so part of the same list is, was the uh, butterfly attractant list. So it's broken down again into flowers, shrubs, trees, and vines. Uh, so there are quite a few, quite a, I, I, I like lists. So um, I figure if I have the lists, then I can always go back and, and take a look at it and, and, and see what I might want to, what I might want to plan. Uh, keeping on the theme of lists, you have the Native Plant Society of Texas. Um, they have, I, I went and found uh, their list and I copied it into a spreadsheet. And this might be hard to read uh, depending on how big it is on your screen. But uh, what I was trying to do was put in the uh, type of butterfly, what the what uh, the what plants that those butterflies like, and then I put in the common family name. So and that way I could sort by by preference. So if I wanted to go to carnations and swallowtails, I could look in here. If I want to target those butterflies, I could look and see what type of things that I should be planting to attract those. So that's what that's what this list is for. Um, and here is an example of a hummingbird and butterfly garden that I found. Uh, this one is about six feet by 28 feet. A diagram some of the plants, how they have them arranged inside there. You have the butterfly bushes that are pretty large right beside this area. Um, you know, they some of the things they have some garden guidelines, but I just thought this was a nice little diagram and potentially a, 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 for somebody who wants to uh, maybe utilize some of this for starting a garden, a butterfly garden. And um, this one is an example of a Monarch way station. So again, at the Pearland Community Gardens, I believe there, there's a Monarch way station that has the label on that over there, um, you know, the, um, out by the YMCA. Uh, so this, had, this shows uh, the, the various types of plants in here. They got some swamp milkweed, butterfly weed, uh, the Joe pie weed, um, and, and, and if you want to set up a Monarch way station, 
you can actually register it. So you can go to this link and you can register your, your own personal monarch way station there. And you can get one of these signs. This is a, uh, this is another list. This is a Houston area native landscape plant list uh, PDF. This is from, um, oh shoot, no, oh, well, uh, Native Plant Society of Texas in, in, in spot. So this is a really nice uh, PDF. Um, I have a link to it over here. Um, you can go through, you can do searches, you know, you can search for butterflies, you can search for hummingbirds. Let's see, there's hummingbirds over here. Uh, this breaks down, it's a 29 page PDF and you can copy it, put it into a spreadsheet, but um, it has various categories. It, it discusses large trees, uh, small trees, tall shrubs, shrubs up to 10 feet, flowering annuals, biennials, perennials, grasses and sedge, ground covers, vines, and it even discusses invasives. So there's a section on invasives here. So this is a really good source to, to, uh, to take a look at. And like I said, I've highlighted some of the butterflies in here. Um, but again, you, know, you can do you can search for different things. It just depends what what you what you want to what you want to look for at the time. But it's a good source for native plant information, and this one is for our area. Another another good resource is this National Gardening Association Plants Database. Um, I found that I was looking up uh, different bush sages, so you know. Uh, are, are looking up sage. So you have millicup sage, the salvia falls in that family. I, I, actually, I was searching salvias. Um, and, and there's different ways of doing the searches in there, but uh, you can pull this up and you can find lots of good information. And it's, it's a, a good resource to keep in mind. And one more is the gardenia plant finder. <laughs> So I love this one. Uh, I went through, there's a lot of things that you could go through and you could select light levels, the water needs. And one thing I didn't discuss about gardening is, is when you're doing your gardening, you wanna, and I did, don't have this on, on these plant slides, but you wanna consider, okay, what, what type of water do these plants need? You know, if I'm gonna group plants in a certain area, you know, I don't want to be mixing wet plants with dry plants. So you just have to keep that in mind as, um, when you're doing your research on the plants when you're, uh, for your, for your uh, butterfly and hummingbird gardens. But this one is one I was looking at. I was looking at all these different agastasia and I ended up buying a whole bunch of different seeds. And so my, my plan is this winter, I want to start raising some different agastasias to plant in the backyard and see how that turns out. In my, in my flower beds. And before I was mostly salvia, but I might try something a little bit different or add to it. Um, the Pearland, the Pearland uh, or the Missouri County Library System is a good resource. When I started this presentation, I, I, pulled, them out, I pulled out a whole bunch of different books. Uh, and, you know, and then I, I like, like I said, I like different books with lists. They have this, um, the, the, down the bottom, the Lone Star Gardener's Book of Lists. This is one that I've had for, for many years. Uh, so some of these lists I had, some of these books I had, but uh, the main thing is, is that you can find these over at the Missouri County Library System. And if they're not at your particular library, you can have it sent to your library. So the, I had all, whole, all these books sent over and I was just looking through them. So Hummingbirds of Texas with our New Mexico and Arizona ranges, 100 Plants to Feed the Monarch. That was a pretty interesting one. Um, the Bird Life of Houston, Gallus and Upper Texas Coast. So in container theme gardens, just lots of, lots of good information right, right close at hand. Uh, various organizations and clubs, uh, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, Texas Master Gardeners. And so here's a list of different clubs. And uh, also, here's a list of the references and resources uh, links that I used when compiling this uh, presentation. And I ran a little bit long. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I guess a couple minutes long. Anyway, I appreciate 
and uh, everyone joining this presentation. I hope you enjoyed it and find it informative. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. We really appreciate it. It was so comprehensive. We had a, several comments in the chat. Nobody asking questions because I think you answered most of the things that were on people's mind. Thank you very much for your time. And I'll just remind people that if you fill out the survey, which is posted in the link on the chat, then you'll receive a copy of the presentation. So um, thank you, everyone. And again, thank you, Richard, for joining us. It was a great presentation. All right, thank you. Good night, everyone.